my god, I'm blocking the live stream, sorry. Hello everyone. Welcome to The Rail. My name's Sophia, I'm the managing director here, and I'm very happy to see such a packed room. Um, a couple housekeeping notes before I hand over to Fong. The bathrooms are down the hallway to the left, and there's a code that is posted on the doorway of them. If you need assistance, please let me know, I'm happy to help, the door's quite heavy. Um, I wanna make a plug for our Instagram, uh, and the live feed that's going on right now, if you ever can't come to an event, you can go online and watch it. Uh, it's free and accessible for everyone. And if you're not on our mailing list already, there's a sign-up sheet going around so that you can know when our issue drops and when we're having exciting events like this. Um, without further ado, I will hand over to Fong Bui. Thank you, everyone. Um, just the other day at lunch, our famous one hour lunch, and it doesn't matter how busy we get, even the last week of the next issue, the production, we always take our time. We would sit down and share ideas and talk about things. And for example, lately we've been reading Baba Nova, uh, the last book of her trilogy, Voyage of the Self. Uh, it was a very illuminating book because she pair a philosopher or a poet with an artist. So in chapter one, it, be it began with Jonathan Eckwood and John Singleton Copley, and the last chapter ends with Charles Olson and Pollock. So just the other day, one of our staff members was trying to speak up the urgency the legitimacy of the now, as opposed to what would be considered the long gone history of the past. And I realized it is the space in between of the past, the then and the now, where the rail thrives, where it essentially permeates and operates. Uh, it's, it's, it's really oscillate. We're trying, trying to foster, to foster dialogue, dialogue that, that really swing back and forth between the lamentation of history that has tendency to repeat itself. And I remember one of my favorite poet, 18th century British, Edward Young, who once said, why is it that we all want original but die as copies? But then, then later, 260 years, I mean, it was Apollinaire and his amazing optimism at Banka, optimism that say, even if nothing is new under the sun, the new spirit does not refrain from discovering new profundity in all this that is not new under the sun. Uh, so this is the condition that we're trying to walk in between. And I know that artists have amazing ability to do that for ages. And I can, I mean, how can you describe someone like Joan Jonas? Remember Joan in the late 60s? I came to New York in late 80s, I was, we were talking earlier, that the, the Bohemian, that incredible East Village and Soho community where n none of those artists, whether poet, actor, filmmaker, you know, non-conformist, so to speak, that you can't really conform them. You can't put, you can't pigeonhole and label un, none of them. You know, that whole spirit is what I'm trying to recreate without nostalgia in the rail because there are so many crossover. And it's important for us to keep that alive at the moment. Uh, and same thing with Federico. Um, we were talking earlier about how loud and bombastic his works for many years that people don't quite understand until recently, uh, particularly with Trump. And also in the work have new life. There's a new incredible present that we can mediate, we can relate to. So all of this back and forth between what is considered historical that we can make some reference to and then the thing that we don't understand at the moment. 
that's where we are right now. So it's a, it's a very nice occasion to have both Barbara here uh, and Eleanor with the two books. Uh, so I thought that maybe we'll begin a few questions. We will talk no more than 20 minutes and half an hour and invite your participation. Please raise questions. And more importantly, buy the books. They are sitting back there. I already bought mine. So remember to buy the books. <laughs> Thank you, Jess. Jesse. Thank you, Larry. Um, so please join me and welcome all the panelists. Martha and I will be moderating. Start working? Oh, good. We both we read the book only uh, this afternoon. We, we did it very fast. But I thought maybe it would be terrific if you would ask the first question. OK. Can do. Um, the first question is, <laughs> well, I was standing there talking back, talking with Barbara, and then Eleanor and I have, you know, we haven't, we didn't dive in yet, but we were kind of thinking about the overlap between these two books, which there's some, perhaps, mm -hmm. but um, yeah. I don't know. Um, doomsday, apocalypse, you know, hope, the future, technology. Um, Time time mm -hmm. exactly i mean i was thinking about it when you were talking because uh the thing is working as historians that's one thing that the two of you definitely have in common is that you're always sort of doing an archaeology so for instance for me i didn't make it very far into the speech without um, mentioning who i write about which is bill and Flusser. at any rate i had to look and um, who, who is a media philosopher, but the history is constantly being rewritten. And so maybe that's the best question to ask is that both of you have been involved in these fields for quite a long time. And going through your books, I can really see the thoughtfulness. And we were talking about the things that had to be added at the last minute, perhaps, or rethought. So maybe where did you start from? And then how do things change over time? or over the writing, since as we know as writers, you sit down, this always happens with criticism. I leave an exhibition and I think, wow, this is gonna be a rave review. And then about halfway right through writing it. <laughs> so, okay. Well, I can start with that. Um, yeah, I mean, my book about doomsday dreams is something that, I mean, in many ways is I have been working on for, I feel like actually decades. Um, it, it's a culmination of things that, um, an artist that I've been thinking about, and um, it, it also kind of grows out of another book that I wrote about Catholicism and contemporary art. But indeed, as, as you suggest, um, as time passed and as events unfolded, the notion of apocalypse has become frighteningly ever more kind of resonant. And that was one of the things that I found in writing the book. I mean, I was you know, constantly sort of going back and, you know, in the beginning I was, I was thinking a lot about kind of George Bush and, you know, the, the clash of civilizations that, um, you know, appeared in, you know, the Gulf War, uh, you know, thinking about the way in which that had impacted the way that we think about everything, politics, everything. And then, of course, as we came up to the Trump era, realizing, you know, frighteningly how this kind of apocalyptic imagination, which I, you know, defined by going back to, oh, back to the book of Revelation and prior to that, this, which is a kind of vision of the world and a vision of, of reality, which is, is seeing us as moving in this kind of inexorable, kind of linear fashion towards this, um, frightening end after which perhaps if we are among the just we will find redemption and and paradise 
but that so many of the kind of aspects of this narrative, which are about the, um, the battle of good and evil and the notion of, of enemies, you know, th those who, who are saved and those who are not, um, the idea of the four horsemen of the apocalypse kind of bearing down on us as harbingers of doom, you know, all of these metaphors began to feel sort of ever more, um, you know, applicable to our own times. So yeah, it was interesting to, you know, and, and kind of scary actually to be working on this. And as everyone says, you know, I say, oh wow, what a topical subject. But I mean, it's something I'd been thinking about for a long time, but it, it yeah, sadly it has not gone out of fashion. But Eleanor, yes. how does that explain your growing up as a Catholic in Des Moines, Iowa, right. and then the fact that you've gone to Chicago University right. study with Marxist philosopher, right. critic, right. Harold right. Rosenberg. Right. Uh, how did that all tie in together? Well, yeah, and in, in fact, I do feel like this book, I, I, I mean, I've written a lot of different kinds of books, but the two books that to me are the most personal and that, that really connect most with who I am mm. are this book and then the other one, Postmodern Heretics, which is my yes. book about Catholicism. I, there's a couple of copies here, I, in case anybody is interested in that. But um, both of those books, I think, came out of my, yes, I, w I was raised Catholic, um, you know, went to Catholic school all the way through high school, got to the University of Chicago, and was pretty much ready to let that go. Um, and, you know, in, in school, yes, I was very interested in kind of more um, philosophical uh, and, and also uh, political aspects, and I didn't really even study art all that much. And I also, at that point, thought that I was done with Catholicism. Mm -hmm. And it was really only many years later coming back, at, you know, as a, you know, an art critic and looking around and beginning to realize how, how formative that experience had been on me in terms of my way of thinking about the world. Yeah. And so both of these books are really thinking about kind of religion and, and, and it, the cultural meanings of religion and how it shapes us and how it shapes our worldview. The mm -hmm. first book is confined more to Catholics, you know, and that was of course something that I identified with as well. Um, the second book dealing with this sort of doomsday idea, which I think is much broader, and is it, although it's grounded in religion, I think it pervades the entire culture, and so it's not so strictly about religion, right. um, although I, I, to kind of organize the book, I organized it kind of around these various kind of religious tropes. Yeah. I just Thank have you. one quick thing also to mention about that that stuck out to me. You know, shifting, um, whether it's, um, you know, topics, but also the sort of methodologies is that the book begins and ends with Elaine Pagels, who's yeah. so not somebody mm -hmm. you would have heard of in mm -hmm. the old days, so maybe you want to say something about that. Yeah, I, yeah, she was actually another person who was very, has been very formative in my thinking. Um, she is a, a, a scholar, early Christian scholar. She's written a number of very, very interesting and um, very scholarly, but also popularly um, you know, received yeah. accessible books, um, starting with the Gnostic Gospels, um, mm -hmm. sort of. Her whole thing has been kind of, in a way, alternative views of what Christianity might have been, because her books were, in, you know, her, her, her uh, her career was really um, inspired by the discovery of these Gnostic Gospels in this urn that had been buried, you know, back in the third century because they had been declared heretical, disappeared for centuries, finally came back, and you know, in, in studying them, realizing that this was another version of Christianity that mm -hmm. could have, in fact, given us a very different world. And she also did a book on the book of Revelation. So that was sort of directly tied into my book. But I, her whole way of thinking has been very interesting to me. Um, and you know, this sort of notion that you know, religion, the, the way that a religion is, is construed and is formed, it, it shapes a whole culture. I mean, it, it's, you know, it, it, it doesn't, this notion of, 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 you know, the linear notion of, of that we're moving towards the apocalypse, this, this idea of conflicts between good and evil, you know, these are sort of baked into our culture now, but it didn't necessarily have to be that way. And so, yeah, she's an important thinker for me. And it's interesting because I got to know your work, Eleanor, mostly through the culture wars critique. Essentially, Andre Soranos, mm -hmm. Maple Thor, right. 
Bob Gober right. and Karen Finlay. Yeah. Uh, so th the whole tenor of this second book is very political, which in a way, when I read your book, Barbara, in the beginning, in your introduction, it began, you, you know, with the late 60s. You know, after you went to the Modern Museum at the Associate Curator in drawing and printed Print. prints first before, you know, before becoming the curator of video. But it was that formation of what's going on in the late 60s, which tied to the women's movement, the civil rights, and certainly the Vietnam War was very, in the height, 68 was a Tate Offensive. So th what interesting was that your, it seems like your evolution becoming the, the first video curated MoMA coincide what's going on in Soho and its East Village and what was going on. And the, for example, how you met Joan is a terrific story. So could you recount that experience? Well, so I'll roll back a little bit. I come from a family of scientists. So what you normally do if you're a child of scientists, you go in the other direction, right? So, and also I played music, and I played the organ in church in my high school years. So I was around church. I also come from a family, they were kind of nomadic, and they were very curious. Um, I went to graduate school, and then very fortunately got a job at MoMA. And For Islamic study. Yeah, I did Islamic studies. So Namjoon Paik used to say to me and laugh and say, okay, Barbara, you studied the trade route between China and the Near East. You were interested <laughs> in the circulation of ideas. So it's very normal that you would then go to video, which is all about communication. Mm. Um, so yes, I was looking for ways to work and have my own territory. Mm. and. Nobody at MoMA cared at all about video, although Reva Castleman, who was a mentor, Jennifer Licht was a mentor, um, MoMA got an NEA grant to buy the first equipment, and then they all said to me, okay, you do it. Yeah. So, of course I did it, and I ran with it. So, then I meet people like Joan, and it was very special, and I meet people like Bill Viola, and I go, I'm going to the mud club, I'm going all over the place, because how did I get information? The only way you get information was talking with Martha Wilson or talking and, because there was nothing written. Mm -hmm. So I had to have an open door and I talked with everybody and I, cha I saved every shred of paper. So now I have these um, graduate art historians coming to me now that I'm no longer at MoMA. I say, my archive is at MoMA. <laughs> You go to special collections and you could read everything. You can also go to my website and read every press release that I ever, it's for every show I ever did. So mm -hmm. once I was doing the book and it was about to come out, that's what I did. I spent time to get all of that out. Um, so, to, and when I teach um, in graduate school, I always say to the students, you have to go to the primary source. You can't just read what somebody else has said. You've got to go and read what Joan Jonas said. You've got to read what Bruce Nauman said. And there are plenty, plenty of interviews and yeah. for you to go and get that. And so I show artists work, you know, blah, blah, blah. So yeah. I, I've always been interested in the new. And so this was, I put together for MoMA the collection of artist books actually around the same time that I was doing um, the video. And then I moved away, the library took the books, and I moved on with video. So I've always been interested in the new, and that's what's so fascinating. As technology changes, artists and the generations change. And I always knew Kennison McShine, the great curator, would say to me, you're gonna know your generation the best, it's your codes, so your generation are the people you understand the best. That's why I teach, to truly try to understand um, what younger people are thinking. Yeah, Joan, did you remember when you first met Barbara? I, rem I remember we were <laughs> in Berlin together, and we go over to East Berlin together. We go on the little subway. That was later. That was, was later. In Berlin in 1982 or 81. 82, I think yeah. We might have met at Open Circuit. I think we met before that. Yeah, but, um, because also there was Castelli Sonnevin, 
mm -hmm. tapes, mm -hmm. and I'm sure we met each other. We must have, because uh, I was already making things in oh my God, your early, ve image. yeah, early '70s. So she was one of the first video. Her videotape version of Raw was one of the first videos to be acquired. <laughs> Great, amazing, uh, John. Uh, when I first met you, pretty much right after I interviewed Richard Serra, you were walking your dog, Ozu. That was not Ozu. <laughs> was it Ozu? Is it Sapo? It's 2005, 2006. That was Zena. Zena, okay. So many dogs, they have to run. <laughs> but um, Richard was telling me, without being with you, without having introduced to Church and Church Theater, um, without going to that special trip with you to Japan, where he was exposed to uh, no theater, mm -hmm. Zen Garden and Zen Buddhism and all of that, he wouldn't have became the artist he's today. So wow. <laughs> no, he say that. He did. Yeah. Well, that's very generous of him. I have to say. It's well, nice. it's just the fact that the reason I'm asking because he's the ultimate hedgehog, where you are the classic fox. Oh, hedgehog you know? and fox. Okay. Yeah, you know, you, 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 some of you might remember that famous Sir Isaiah Berlin essay it's called The Hedgehog and the Fox that were published earlier, maybe early 50, but it was published in his popular volume. It's called Russian Thinker in 1977. It's essentially defined two types of artistic temperament. The hedgehog, the one who can relate to everything in the world but have to filter through one singular vision. And the fox, to whom the world cannot be boiled down with one reading. In other words, I guess you can, you can refer someone like Bob Ryman or Agnes Martin at the Hitchhawk, whereas maybe um, Louis Bourgeois or Joan is the fox. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But John, my point is that early on in the late 60s, the 70s, when you were making works, just recently when you came to my home, um, you identified my Shapiro and you have studied with him at Columbia and you studied with Nicholas Corone in drawing and you also told me you studied with Peter Agostini. It's hard to mediate and understand all the things that you do because you can't really label Joan a particular kind of artist. Uh, could just share some of that sentiment. Joan. No, I mean, I think it, um, I'm not sure what that would be a particular kind of artist. I could just be an artist, right? <laughs> no, um, because people are always trying to um, label you. It yes. A da First of all, it was a dancer and then, and then a video artist and a performance artist, mm. all of terms I really don't like very much. Anyway, no, but my way of approaching what I do, and also um, I studied art history and mm -hmm. li literature, and, and when I began, when I shifted from sculpture, which I wasn't happy with, it wasn't good, believe me, um, when I shifted from that to performance, um, which I was drawn into performance by seeing the work of dancers and visual artists in the city. Yeah. I suddenly felt that was my medium, but when I went into that form, you know, I really thought about it for a couple of years before I did yeah. anything. I really thought of it as what I did is um, bring together all these different forms, and I made, I did make a statement saying I don't see a major difference between a poem, a painting, um, you know, film, a drawing. I took all those things, those forms mm -hmm. together. So Yeah. All these different forms, and then I include different disciplines in there to yeah. make it work, like drawing, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. consideration of what I learned from looking at paintings, and, yeah. and the flat surface and three dimensions, to, and then theater, going to Japan and seeing the no theater that had a huge mm -hmm. influence on me because yeah. it's a visual theater, yeah. and I suddenly saw, you know, this is something I can really relate to. So that's how. Yeah. Um, was that a early on a political decision, Joan? I wouldn't call it political. Okay. No, I didn't think of it as political. It was my method of defining my work and 
yeah. deciding how I was going to. Yeah. to uh, Is it political for you? To do the work that I do? Yeah. Well, yes. Uh, poli politics is part of, uh, you know, the life that's around us. Um, and uh, as an artist, you want to deliver a message and, uh, you know, uh, I feel that uh, for me, definitely politics uh, is an important part of, uh, of my existence, you know. And particularly, like, you know, in this uh, very, like, you know, uh, mad political arena, you know, so... Yeah. Um, you were mentioned early on that you thought of Leon Gallup and Nancy Sparrow and other artists. Well, I, I adore them because, uh, you know, um, they were a way of expressing, they were very visceral, like, you know, and uh, for me, um, um, I very connect to this uh, method of, of expressing, to go straight to, you know, to deliver a message without compromising, you know, so... Yeah. All of the writer uh, that I admire, all the artists, the filmmaker, they tend to, you know, to be uncompromising, you know. So, well, how do you feel now that that what with Trump, you know, does it so many <coughs> reference between him and Mussolini, for example? Does being Italian mm -hmm. have any kind of significant reading of the American well, politics? <laughs> Well, you know, uh, I've been here for 20 years, you know, in uh, this country, like, you know, and um, definitely, like, uh, the situation degenerates a bit, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but I wouldn't say that it's just, like, Trump uh, uh, is, a, is a combination of factors that uh, brought, you know, the political party to be, you know, to be kind of, uh, you know... Um, irrelevant to what uh, the expectation that the people has, you know. So, uh, to me, when I look at uh, CNN, I feel as disappointed as when I look Fox News, you know. So, it's not that uh, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. I say, oh, Trump is the bad guy and, uh, you know, everyone else is fantastic. Like, you know, I just, uh, you know, uh, try to dig into history of America, history of civilization, to find common pattern that somehow gave a logic explanation of uh, since history, as you say, repeat itself, how we get to this and how we try to move forward from this. As, as an artist, you have a lot of fantasy, a lot of imagination, a lot of like uh, potential of storytelling that, uh, you know, you create your, you know, sort of parallel universe that uh, mm -hmm. help you to um, you know, making fun of the world in which you live or, you know, realize how tragic is the moment, you know, so. There's a, there's a piece of, of yours that I saw um, at White Box Gallery ah. in 2015. Yeah, possible. It's called Pop, Pope's Fucking Machine. Oh, wow. Leonardo. That's a really <laughs> rough piece. Can you describe a little bit for those people who haven't well, seen this, it? Well, this is a really rough piece. So that's part of, like, uh, my transition from Italian culture and American culture. So when I left Italy, I felt, uh, you know, the imagery of Catholic Church was completely overwhelming. And to be honest, I really realized how influenced I was until I started to read uh, uh, Eleanor's book. I read, I read the first book of Eleanor, Postmodern Heretics, uh, 10 years before I met her in person. Mm -hmm. And I said, wow. I didn't know, actually, I don't know, it's not working, okay. I didn't know how traumatized I was by, you know, being an altar boy, uh -huh. going to see your first murder and decapitation in a church that you go three, four times a week, uh, uh -huh. you know, and my parents they were not religious too, you know, they were sending us because we were five kids and they want us out of the house, you know, so, <laughs> and uh, the church and interacting with the priest, like it was always like, you know, uh, very frustrating, you know. Uh, but then you go into church, you see San Sebastian killed by the heralds. You have the massacre of the innocents. And then you go to the main cathedral in Bologna and you have one of the most horrific frescoes in the history, I think, of early Renaissance by Giovanni di Modena. It's basically like show you hell in a very incredible size, like, you know, and it's perfectly 
maintain, you know. And you go there and say, holy shit, you know. So, and then after school, my father will tell me, Federico, after school, you come to the store and you help us to clean, you know. And I was going to my father, he was a butcher, you know. Yeah. And I will see like, you know, all of these like <laughs> slaughter animals, like continuously, like, you know. So that, that, that was kind of like the surrounding that, uh, that uh, you know, I was, I grew up, which I didn't realize until I moved to the United States. Yeah. And I have this kind of like, uh, and by the way, like reading the Eleanor book, especially the first one, um, I may really, really merely understand that all of this like hell, paradise, uh, necessity of destroying everything and rebuilding a better world was mm. all coming from them, you know, and I, I completely yeah. did not, uh, you know, uh, well, going back to the piece that you, you told me, is one of my most visceral pieces, it's a mechanical sculpture in which you have like, you know, a functional pope that somehow is like, uh, sort of like uh, having sex with the mask of some ruthless politician, you know, because in my imagery, like, you know, I felt so traumatized by, by this imagery that there was sort of like a vindication, like a revenge, you know, a revenge. And I put this political, this religious leader uh, and compare her as bad as, as, uh, as some of the worst dictators in history. Because at the end, like, you know, I saw a lot of, you know, uh, terrible decisions made by, by popes and, you know, and I somehow like, you know, create an environment in which they were all the same, you know, mm -hmm. and, uh, mm -hmm. and that's how it was, you know, so. Yeah, um, Barbara, what, what was that? <laughs> 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 well, <laughs> no, I, mean the I, I didn't grow up Catholic, so I don't have that experience, but I, I, being in New York and I went to hear the Fugs, I did all kinds of weird stuff, you know. But no, but your account of what? Joseph, jo your account of Joseph Boys. Sure. That's a political, so, okay, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's another kind of politics, but. So, you know, there I am, I keep my ear to the ground, and Boyce has come, he's arrived in an ambulance, so he's left the airport, he doesn't have to touch a foot of U.S. soil, he arrives at Renee Block's gallery, he's confined with a coyote, and there's a daily newspaper, and there's a whole ritual, and blah, blah, blah. And then I learned he left the cage and he had dinner up in Renee's you know, gallery every day. You know, no way was he in that room all alone all the time. You know, so yeah. it's like, yeah, that's the myth. So there are all kinds of myths. Um, and then now I have young art historians coming to me. Oh, Barbara, you did the sound art show in 1979 and they're pouring over the MoMA archives. And it's like, you know, that was a very small show with Connie Beckley. Um, Julia Hayward, I think, was in it, and an artist from California, three women. And it's like, the poor deer, you know, she was trying to find, you know, s meat there. And it was like one of like six shows I did in that year, but I tried to help her. So yes, so the young art historians or the young artists are going back and looking. And as my husband used to say, because he's very involved with Sumerian, you know, the very antiquity, he says, what is old is new again. You know, that's like normal. Um. Arthur? I'm up. Uh, well, okay, I'll, I, it sounds like we're gonna probably break this out in a minute, but in terms of what's old is new again, um, something that I've been thinking about um, in reading your book and in an early conversation with Joan, the fact that, um, sorry, this mic is really not very good. Um, that uh, when you said you're interested in new technology, but one of the things that I kind of kept waiting, waiting, waiting is VR. It's VR. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. and yeah, at the very end. And the thing is that's funny is for me, that's like an old thing that's new again. And of course, it's got a whole sort of history around it because, you know, Facebook bought Oculus and whatnot. But um, I was just um, in Berlin and hanging out with these very sort of tech transmedia people <coughs> and some people that sort of surprised me would say this, that were, they were not into VR because of a number of things. They thought it was disgusting, the headset had all these germs, they didn't want to put it on, whatever, and I was like, well, okay. Um, but it, to sort of tie this in with Joan, the conversation that we were having, over time what's happened for me is I used to not be able to show um, works like Song Delay, which is, you know, sort of one, I mean, 
along with vertical roll, one of my favorites, but now you can show those in class. And we were talking about, you know, but they're on the internet, so that's kind of a degraded quality. Um, but I'm interested with all of you in terms of thinking about, you know, again, like the uh, apocalypse never goes out of style. It's the thing that's always new again. So um, I don't know, but maybe starting with you in terms of thinking of this idea, when people say new media, a lot of the media scholars kind of like hate the term. So, Well, I think it's true. Like Joan said, she's an artist, period. So it doesn't matter what tool she uses. Um, also, the tools keep changing, so either you're going to keep up to date or you're not, or you're going to salvage your work. So I tell my students, you're the curator of your life if you don't take care of it. Nobody else will, so it's incumbent on you. Um, and indeed, VR is just another tool. It's just another assemblage of image, sound, and yes, that headset is disgusting. And um, I mean, not just because of the germs, but because it's so limiting. Um, so to me, I don't care about definitions. Definitions are just handles, and we use them for a moment, and then we move on. We redefine, and we're always redefining the same way that the tools are always going to be upgraded. Um, so, and also, we're going to figure out the exhibition of it. You know, you worked very hard to show your work when we didn't have projectors at the kitchen or at um, Global Village, they would mass monitors all together. So you got your scale that way by about 40 monitors. Um, <coughs> uh, C.T. Louis? Louis, sure. There was a guy, um, there was, um, guy on um, West Broadway below Canal Street. C.T. Louis, his name was. And my first video performance at um, Lo Giudici, I got a video, uh, I got a projector from him. And it would break down all the time, and he'd come and f he'd come and fix it himself. Right. And for years, I went to C. T. Louis. I don't know if anybody else remembers him, but it was amazing. I just want to say also that I am, I very much consider my work in the political sense. Yeah, but that was just telling you my method. But um, yeah. yeah, and content. So I, in in relation to that, would I try to, you know, I think that I could forever explore how to translate a narrative into a video piece, an installation. How do you do that? That's very not easy. And then the content, um, how do you choose a subject and what subject and what relevance does it have to the present? And that's what I think about things. You know, how can I, not to be overtly political, but you know, what relation does the subject have to the, and as far as VR, um, <laughs> I always say that I'm an old fashioned video artist. You know, I'm still working with cameras and you know, I could forever work with a camera. But um, they are. There's a new group developing VR. You know, Daniel Birnbaum is. Yeah. You know. Yes. And he recently approached me. I'll try it. No, but I mean, I think it's interesting to just. What I don't like about what f for me about new technology, which is different from when we began, it's not hands-on in the same way. And when yeah. we began, you know, you could do this. You know, you did, and you could change the image. Like Namjoon put a magnet on the top of the TV set, changes the image. So now it's uh, new technology, what you call new technology, whatever that is. Um, it's not hands-on like that. It's all indirect through the electronic. So yeah. that's the difference. I'm interested yeah. in hands-on. Yeah. How do you get in and experiment that way? Yeah. But I just want to say what Namjoon did, we all talk about, oh, interactivity. We have it with the computer and the software. But Namjoon, with that magnet, this was interactivity before there was a name for it. So yeah. in theory, the viewer was supposed to be able to come in to Howard Wise Gallery or another space, move the magnet, and woo, woo, the image became all colorful and crazy. Um, yeah. Yeah. But then, of course, if a museum buys that, then, of course, the public is not allowed to touch it. <laughs> And what do they do? They have a video or, you know, yeah, of it in action. So at least the attempt is made to sh give the viewer the experience. Um, yeah. So. Um, you know, I'm thinking just now um, about your book, Shift into Politics. We'll come back to video in a minute. But I just realized that um, Benito Mussolini, his first name um, is not an Italian name. That was given to him by his father and his mother, a uh, devout Catholic t school teacher, and the father was a blacksmith, both are very committed socialists. And they given him that first name based on Juarez, Benito Juarez, the 
the, the, the liberal Mexican president, the president, exactly. And even when you think about his first, uh, the two middle names, Amicare um, Copriani, and also Andrea Costa. So uh, I think that it's, it's, we have to go back when, when Mussolini, only when he advocated for the Italian intervention in the First World War that he was kicked out from the Socialist Party. And that's when he became Can the I fascist. Can I just say a word? Simone Forti, who's a good, I don't think she would mind me yeah. saying this. She grew up, she's Italian. That's the first thing she said to me about Trump. Mm -hmm. remind, she said, it's like Mussolini. Yeah. So I'm just saying Because that. he was once a Democrat also. Well, whatever, and she escaped. <laughs> she just barely yeah. escaped from Italy. Yeah, it's true, Joan. Um, and ultimately, the, the fascists you know, based a lot of their program on, you know, uh, the apocalypse. I mean, it's very, it's very apocalyptic. The mm -hmm. you know kind mm -hmm. of way in which um, you know they, the, the politics, even lo sort of looking back to, you know, the way that they were looking back to Rome and then forward to this in, in this notion of you, you have to raise everything, you have to destroy everything, and yeah. then there will be. Oh, if we lost this, and and then and then there will be this new world. So it's it, yeah. I mean that that the fascist program was all you know very much conditioned by this kind of apocalyptic thinking and to go back to Martha's point about what's old and actually Barbara's point what's old is new the whole point of the apocalypse is that every era seems to get its own apocalypse and reshape it in its own way mm -hmm. and so we and that's why maybe we see this kind of you know, parallel now between Mussolini, between some of these earlier kind of mm -hmm. fascist and authoritarian leaders and you know certain figures today. Yeah, have you ever thought of uh, manifest uh, destiny? We oh, tend yeah. to forget all about that. Well, yeah, I mean, that. I in fact, the United States is also, I mean, there, there's, as I say, every era has its own apocalypse. It reshapes the apocalypse, th this, this apocalyptic narrative to its own purposes. And you know, America was really born also of this notion of, of apocalypse, the idea of mm -hmm. the new Jerusalem. And so that was part of the whole manifest destiny thing as well, is that, you know, pushing forward out, you know, outward into the world, pushing this, this uh, because these were the, you know, they were the warriors for the right, you know, for, for the good, you know, they, they were the representation of, of the forces of good, um, sort of wiping out, you know, the forces of evil around them. So United States, um, you know, was really born also of this kind of very apocalyptic kind of mm -hmm, thinking. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it, it manifests itself, um, you know, through throughout history on many different levels and it sometimes it's more benign and sometimes it's it's more horrific. Yeah. Have anything to say about speed which is so much about in speed. Speed your work uh, is about speed. Well, and uh, speed is power. Um, at the moment you just told me speed I was thinking about the futurist uh, like you know and um, um, you know their like you know support of uh, you know fascism and Many of the, you know, some of the most remarkable die in during the war. Um, it's not that I, I connected with my work, but immediately the war speed came to um, to mind with the futurists. Well, to me, like you know, I feel uh, this, uh, you know, uh, exuberant uh, uh, and uh, overwhelming um, um, imagery that there is in my work. Uh, is uh, in, a, in a way like you know I feel attacked by society and attacking back like you know in a way there is this kind of like uh, I like to overwhelm um, the viewer because for me as an individual also working in New York in the most extreme uh, society I feel like you know uh, I feel constantly to need overwhelm to be overwhelmed uh, to to try to find clarity, like, you know, to, uh, I'm obsessive uh, um, readers. Uh, I try to get as much information as I can in order to conclude, or like, uh, the points I want to make in, in life, in my career, like, you know. Um, that, I think, has a lot to do with, uh, you know. And then, of course, we are overwhelmed. There is no question about uh, media and, uh, you know, like, uh, TV and advertisement, you know, but I'm here for that. I, I 100% uh, sure, like, you know, that I came to New York because I want to live in an extreme society, you know, and uh, definitely I, get, I got it from New York, you know, so. <laughs>
What do you think, Martha? Should we, you want to ask one more question before we open up to the floor? I don't need to. You don't need to? We got a lot of people here. That's true. Mostly artist friend. Hi. Yeah. Can you get a portable? Not really. Can you speak? Can you stand up? Yeah. I Well, I think there's a lot that will get lost, and I don't like that fact, um, but I think institutions, you've got the, con the conservation department of both MoMA, SF MoMA, the Tate, and then NYU has a conservation program for media. MoMA, when I started, it was me and two projectionists, and we handled everything. Um, now there are four media conservators, they do software, they do all this stuff. Um, I got into the collection a piece by Teiji Furuhashi, a beautiful, beautiful work called Lovers. He sadly died of AIDS in, I think, 1996. Um, so this work is fragile. There's a work of Gary Hills that's fragile. Mm -hmm. There are other works that um, are very dependent upon technology. And um, it's, it's, it's very difficult. It's very sad and it, it, some things might die or what you have to do and what institutions do is they talk to Joan. I got in one of her pieces called Mirage. And we sat down with Joan and we spent a long time talking about what the aesthetics are. And that's key. <clears throat> well, it's like any form in that way. The, the, art, the, the, the museum records exactly what the artist wants. But I think um, we all There are copies all over the world of everybody's work, you know, and it's being reproduced and copied and copied and copied, and that's the other nature of the beach of the beast. But also with time-based work, um, whether it was Joan's performance early on or Caroline Schneemann's work, um, or you know, many artists, these time-based works, you're going to have one impression, you're going to have another impression, you're going to have an impression you're going to have an impression because it's <laughs> dependent upon what is inside us at that moment when we saw the work and it's going to be different on, on another day. So if you read what somebody wrote, don't take it all as gospel truth. You've got to read multiple <laughs> opinions and um, as John said, it's a very complicated thing. <laughs> thing is too is that the approach to art history even contemporary art history changes radically so and I know this from firsthand experience um, I mean I started studying art history really young when I was 16 and then I started a PhD under Rosalind Krauss so it was a very formalist approach but also she had specific people she really liked and then when I finished many years later um, the person who I was at the Graduate Center and Claire Bishop was there and it was like an ent entirely sort of different cast of characters and you know she was very pro performance and in fact everything was talked about like even if it were I don't know a painting or something it might be talked about in a sort of like gestural, gestural painting as performative. So the thing is that um, you know 
a lot of the video even, you know, there was that show at uh, DIA of EAI a few years ago, and it, you know, you realize that they collected or they amassed within the first, you know, four years of EAI, like something like 2,000 videos. So the interest in a certain, um, you know, luckily people have always been interested in Joan's work, but there are always people coming up that you've sort of never heard of, you know, like Fred Forrest, or Fred Forrest is one of the people that um, is aligned with some of the people that I work with. But I also had one thing I wanted to say about the politics of your work as well, too, is when you were saying, you know, sort of pushing back at culture is that you guys were taking back television at a moment where I think it's hard to realize now the sort of monodirectional way in which television operated back then, and but you know, I don't. Well, television and the Museum of Modern Art—they were the big bad ugly, because they were closed to a lot of the young artists. So that was what I had to go up against and say to artists like Joan. Not maybe not Joan, because she was more amenable, <laughs> but others, I would say, because I started a, um, a, just a conversation and screening program, and I'd say, I want you to come up to MoMA to talk about your work and show it, and your words are what's important, because I'm gonna record what you say, and that's gonna go down for posterity. Um, but I was trying to break that barrier down, and indeed, television, um, was one way. I'll just make another word for television. When we started out, every Friday night, there was a program on Channel 13, right. and they showed work like mine. Yeah. And um, the first, one of my first videos early, I edited at Channel 13, they commissioned it. There was a program at J WGBH in Boston that Kathy, Kathy, uh, um, um, whatever. TV lab. Yeah, the TV lab. So there were, I mean, at the beginning, and then we all thought, oh, cable, that's going to be our entry. But that was public television, and that was with money from the Rockefeller Foundation that the artist TV, TV lab got started in San Francisco, Boston, and New York, and it lasted, I don't know, 10 years yeah, or so. It's over. It's over. It's over, yes. No more NEA. <laughs>
Well, well that's also, that sounds like you're putting it all on the environment. I just want to quote um, Bong Joon-ho, my favorite filmmaker. Um, who just, after the Academy Awards, he came out and he said, people said, well, why did this film, you know, uh, uh, sort of appeal to so many people? And he said, well, because, you know, he sort of played it in these different parts of the world, but that all kind of came back with people saying, well, we basically all live on, in the same country, and that country's name is capitalism. <laughs> so that was one of the things with your book that I kept thinking about is, you know, there's the, the apocalypse of the religious sort that we've been talking about, but ours is either of the um, well, environmental it's, it's or... It's economic, yeah. environmental. And, but uh, yeah, I, yeah, I'd like to sort of yeah, address that um, environmental issue because absolutely it's one of the things I was thinking about in the book was, is, you know, this, you know, one of, yeah, certainly one of our, we, ha we seem to have a lot of apocalypses actually, I would say, but the environmental one is I mean, perhaps the most profound one right now. And one of the things that, um, perhaps is making it difficult for us to deal with it is that we, because, you know, we're sort of so overwhelmed with this notion of the end and, you know, the, the film's all about, you know, kind of the, you know, the, the, the um, you know, death, either the apocalypse comes by fire, it comes by nuclear holocaust, it comes by, you know, um, artificial intelligence, it, you know, it, it comes by, you know, whatever, however it is that it comes. But, our, our thinking about things like the environment is, and, and everything is sort of shaped by this idea of you're, you're going from, um, you know, you're going towards this end, this fiery end. And one of the things I, at, at, at the end of the book, um, I wanted to pose was the possibility that perhaps there are other non-apocalyptic ways of thinking about things like this, and particularly about thinking about the environment in a different way. Not thinking about the environment so much um, in, in, you know, in, in a way Smithson sort of haunts us all, his notion of entropy and how we're all, you know, whole, the whole thing is just running down. But, you know, that there are other traditions and other religious traditions that I think offer perhaps a, a more positive and hopeful way, you know, we are trying to find hope in all of this, of, of thinking about things. And there's a Jewish tradition of tikkum olam, which is repairing the earth. There are, um, um, you know, th there's actually even within uh, Christianity, there are um, some interesting figures, some e e evangelical figures who are talking about stewardship of the earth. So it, it, part of it is that, you know, we have these models and these ways of thinking, um, and, and they, they not only kind of come from our experience, but they drive our experience. And so part of it is how do we kind of break out of that, and are there other ways of thinking, and, and you know, how do we free ourselves? I can't remember, but do you mention Thomas Cole in your book? Because it's not all just like, there are many other, even within Western art, within Western thinking in terms of, you know, regeneration instead yeah. of just a teleology that, you know, first of all, it's not the Earth's problem. The Earth is, as the Thomas Cole, you know, right. Course of Empire yeah. shows us, like after the humans are yeah. gone, the Earth will carry right. on. But well, there, yeah, no, there, there's a book called, the, the, what is it, the world with, the earth without us. And it's talking about how long would it take if you just, if you extracted all the humans, you know, and it left everything else the same, how long would it take? And it wouldn't take that long for things to repair themselves. We're expendable. <laughs> Thanks, this was absolutely fabulous. Thank you all, you're all brilliant. Um, I have a semi-personal question about courage. If we're facing a major apocalypse as opposed to some minor ones or middling ones, we're also facing the possibility of persecution and self-censorship and censorship. So I wonder what any of you might be able to say about your personal experience or your personal thoughts about entering into this political phase where we may all be in danger to varying degrees of real lethalness. Of, of censorship, you mean? Of, of censorship, um, being thrown in jail, being murdered. Well, I, I think that, that we don't need to address this. I think. Um, 
No, well, if I just want to say one thing. Uh, the gentleman says uh, the word grotesque, uh, and, uh, and then I'll answer very quickly. One of the most incredible writers I encountered was uh, Oriana Fallaci, and I remember she wrote something that completely changed my mind. She said, people, the book was probably conversation with history um, or interview with history, and she said something that completely changed my, my life, and she said, writer, they always talk about how an historian, how horrible it's been Stalin, how horrible it's been Hitler, whatever. But she said, but people never talk how funny this character could be also because they surrender themselves with fake uh, medals, um, fake battle, uh, you know, ba battle uh, trophy, uh, this ridiculous uh, uh, atmosphere of pompous uh, uh, celebration and this has a huge impact on me and a huge encouragement to do the work that I do which by the way is being censored and is censorship is a big thing it's also in the US hard work people don't see it but it is huge it is huge it doesn't come probably in the mouth of everybody like you know but I feel like you know even lately which I think my work is much more approachable compared to five years ago. I think, you know, by becoming older, I feel like, you know, you can play around more with irony instead of being so visceral, like, you know, and I've been censored multiple times, but nobody knows that, you know, so, and sometimes I've also been censored for things that I thought were completely irrelevant, to, to be honest, like, you know, simply because there is a phrase that a certain museum, the patron uh, doesn't like uh, that, you know, you're a fan of certain country, Censorship is already huge here, you know, I mean, it's already huge in my, in my personal experience, you know, and I don't want to go into details because I have a lot of people that support me, institution, to, to help me to, to, do, to be where I am, you know, and, uh, but it's, it's a big problem for curator, it could be a big problem because they're afraid of losing their job, you know, so um, I think like, you know, it would be nice to see some more courage from everybody, like in the arts, including artists, you know, because a lot of them, they are afraid of, uh, you know, of being cut out, you know, of certain situation. Like, you know, to me, you know, thanks God, I'm, st I'm still able to do a lot of things and, you know, I have a lot of museum uh, exhibition coming, so, and I feel blessed, you know, because uh, with uh, the work that uh, Eleanor reviewed <coughs> in this book, um, I had a court case, you know, a court case in Italy, which I was very frightened because, uh, you know, um, uh, basically, I was accused to do uh, no work of art, but object of, uh, you know, they weren't even considered art. The police went to an art fair, I'm talking about 10 years ago, and I went to took all of my work, and I have to go through lawyers. And, um, you know, it was very frightening because I was already living in the United States. I don't have, you know, I don't have anybody that could defend me. And actually, here tonight, you know, I just saw it, I was never planned. There is a, a gentleman that, uh, basically uh, helped me to resolve this case. His name is Renato Miracco. At the time of my uh, issue with the Italian government, the Italian church, uh, he was curating a retrospective of Giorgio Morandi at the Metropolitan Museum. And, uh, you know, simultaneously with the same work, I won the Guggenheim Fellowship in the same year for video. And, uh, you know, he wrote a letter to, to the judge in Bologna and said, listen, this guy is a serious artist. You know, you can't just like... Uh, you know, I don't remember in details, like, you know, the but through his letter, I was able to, to walk away, you know, with uh, w stopping the perse persecution of, you know, so that's how.
I just say one thing. No, I just say one thing. Yeah. Right. Oh, thank you. Okay. <laughs> well, thank you. Yeah. No, just to say one thing. Um, yeah, that this question of sort of atheists and, 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 and belief and, um, yeah, I mean, the real problem is when religion gets mixed up with politics. And, and that really is part of what I'm tracing in this book. So it's not so much necessarily the, the faith, at, you know, the original faith, but it's what, it, it, it gets contaminated. It, it, it gets, um, you know, sort of infiltrated. It turns into something else. So there's a sort of this toxic relationship between religion and politics, and you, you can trace that throughout history. I was going to say to your thing about irony, too, that's sort of generational. Um, I'm Generation X, so we're pretty, um, we're pretty into the irony. And, um, but the younger people, like Greta, however you say your last name, Thunberg or whatever, that's not ironic. You know, there's no irony there. And people have sort of commented on that Gen Z crowd, you know, that there, there's, uh, you know... So it's, that's kind of an interesting thing, and you can see it in art, you know, whereas yours focuses on, apo on uh, the apocalypse. Yeah. Yeah. Well, maybe they don't do it. <laughs> no, I mean, yes, we were talking. I'm just saying that um, years ago I said to my students at MIT, I don't know you're, why you're not out in the street marching. You know, even then, um, there were very, very serious issues happening. But I do think that uh, our hope, if there is such a thing as hope, is in the young, is very young people. And I think the next thing, practically speaking, get out and vote. Everybody. And, and then I talked to a friend of mine who went to New Hampshire, and she said, there are a lot of people who are undecided, and they have to be talked to. And all those people that voted against Hillary, they're not going to necessarily vote for Trump again. So, uh, you know, it's a really, it's a crucial moment. Thank you. 
I'll just try to be brief. I, I was very interested in film, and I, had, I didn't study film in school, but I, went, I studied it by myself, going to see films, doing a lot of research, and looking at the history of film. I wanted to make films. The film, I did make a couple of films, but I worked with filmmakers. You know, Peter Campus and Bob Fiore, were th because working, a film camera is m so much more complicated than a video camera, and doing the light readings and so on. And, the video was just an amazing, all you have to do is push a button. <laughs> and also I liked the... Exactly. Well, missing from my work. I, so it, it enabled me to um, record my work, but I, I wanted it to, be, I wanted to make, I called them films. When I first, my first video pieces to myself, I called them little films that I could make completely at home. And I think that was the appeal for most video artists, that they could work at home with very simple technology. And also it was radical at that time. Filmmakers hated video, you know, because it was, it was flat and grainy, but we loved it, you know, we loved the look of it, and so on, that's why. But also, there was a big element of the now, mm -hmm. that you could see the image right there and then, you could push record, or Joan used the monitor as a mirror and she'd already worked a lot with mirrors, so, this, so, but the whole thing of the immediacy, um, and that you didn't have to send your film out to be developed. And immediately after recording, you could point back and look right. at it. Right. I guess this is a two-part question, what was your first Um, it's hard. <laughs> Many. Well, I mean, uh, well, no, I got a video camera in 1970 when I went to Japan, and Namjoon already had one, and um, there were a bunch of people sitting around talking about it, and everybody got one, and um, I think everything I did, like I thought about the vertical roll, was me referring to the frames in a film going by. So I made references all the time to film, and that. Those are not differences, yet, but they are differences, but I incorporated that into the language of my videos. But um, I, when, I, you know, when I, I grew up, with, our family would sit around watching, you know, we'd put chairs in front of the TV set and watch Sid Caesar and Imogene Coca, you know. And comic, you know, comedy was one of the main um, forms that interested me and I loved. So there was all that anyway. Yeah, no, no. I mean, I, I think, yes, there are measures that the you know, world is getting, you know, certain things are getting better, but this it's true, the climate thing is, 
as they say, an existential threat. I mean, the climate change is the thing that could, it could really bring everything down. No, I, I think we're in a more, and, and also, you know, the global economy, is, it, things are more interconnected, so when things go down, they all go down. Um, you know, they, they, and now we're sort of, you know, the nuclear um, kind of threat, which was, seemed to be in abeyance, you know, is now once again rising. You know, the, the um, uh, what is it, the, the atomic scientists, they have this doomsday clock, and, you know, they, they have, it's midnight, and then how many minutes to midnight, you know, and, and they keep sort of adjusting it, you know, you know, how close are we, midnight being, of course, the end. And, you know, a, a few years ago, they switched it from, I think it was two and a half minutes to two. Now it's, I, I believe it's one and a half minutes. Mm -hmm. I mean, they keep bringing it closer. So, no, I, I think it is more dangerous now. Can I just say? And um, species are becoming extinct, you know, as we sit here, many species. And the fire in Australia just killed mi billions, billions of um, insects and birds and animals. And we have a very dangerous person leading this country right now. He's dangerous. Is your question how much is social? This is a tricky question because, like, what people said about novels, it's a private form, you know, and it kind of goes back to this whole. I, mean, I hate to say it, capitalism, individual, you know, whatever, but. Uh, so, you know, the old model of standing in front of a painting where linear perspective programmed one viewer, you know, the, I don't know, it's tricky to say, you know, with the immersive, immersive environments, maybe they're more collective, performance, relational aesthetics, they were trying to be more collective, but um, I don't know, you know, it, maybe the, the goal for you, if you want to work in VR, is sort of like hijacking that private space, which is what Mark Zuckerberg said when Facebook bought um, Oculus and they said, well, the problem with VR, the reason it failed the first time is it was too claustrophobic, it was too, indi the one individual sitting within the lens, and his, uh, his argument was, well, we're a social media network, we're going to bring your friends in. That's exactly what he said. Has that happened? I don't think so, you know, but I don't know. 
uh, also, our whole viewing experience has changed. Your generation, I see people at MoMA doing selfies. That's all they do. They went into Kusama's piece, which is mirrored, and it's very experiential. They were doing friggin' selfies, you know, like, so, I mean, man, I don't know. It's like, it's just. <laughs> I want to say something positive, and that is. Uh, <laughs> no, well, art is about communication. It's about communicate. I mean, when I make a work, I want people to see it. And I think most artists do want other people to see their work and share it. And also, um, even though we have this idea about the, the viewer, there's also other, other people standing around, and then we talk about it and share our experiences. Reading novels, I just read, I've been reading Sally Rooney's novels. I don't know how many other people in the room have been reading. You know, we talk about it, and, and it affects our way of, um, that's just one example, but it affects our way of, um, uh, seeing the world, and it also, I remember the idea that they're reading, um, whatever, in China, they're reading American novels, you know. So it's also a communication across boundaries. Books, books are so important as uh, communication devices. So uh, art, art is great. <laughs> Oh, the back, okay. Artists need to create on the same scale the society has capacity to destroy. The only way to, for us artists to counter Trump is exactly what John said, to make art, to write poetry, to do everything that slowed everything down. But we want you to buy the book very fast. Thank you for coming. <laughs> Thank you, everybody.